Okay, let's get underway. So, I officially, as, so my name is Rick Wycheck. I'm the acting director of NIEHS, and I want to welcome all of you to the 159th meeting of the National Advisory Environmental Health Sciences Council. So, the first thing we want to do is uh, I need to remark that pursuant to the Government in the Sunshine Act, all aspects of this meeting are open to the public except the review, discussion, and evaluation of grant applications and related information. So there are two council members that are not present, uh, Dr. Patrick Sung and Michael Slimak, and Maureen Lichtfeld will be here for tomorrow's session, but not today. And Pat, I, guess I think that there are a number of council members who are WebExing into the meeting. Right, we have three, Dr. Shukmei Ho, uh, Andy Shi and Bill Sabulas, sorry Bill, um, who are on, and we, are you all on the WebEx? Can you let me know if you're on? Here. Is that Andy or Bill? Sorry, that's Andy. Okay. Shukmay, are you on? Okay. Um, yeah, I, ha I have you as being on, so hopefully you can hear us. So if you can't, please send us an email. I can hear you. I, I'm on the phone also on the video. Okay, thank you. All right. Pardon me? You can? Can you hear me? Okay, the next order of business is to uh, recognize the service of a couple of retiring council members. So Erasma, Erasma Coronado, would you mind coming up to the podium? And we have our photographer here. And I have a certificate here signed by Alex Azar II. I don't, I, it was first on the list. I don't know why. Yeah, we'll do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You should have done that just now. I'll get him to do it before. Also, I want to recognize Jose Manitao, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the podium. I think it's time to go around the room for introductions, so I will start. Uh, again, I'm Rick Wycheck, the Acting Director of NIEHS, and to my left in my primary seat is? Gwen Coleman, I'm Acting De Deputy Director of NIEHS. I'm Daryl Zeldin, I'm Scientific Director. I'm Brian Berridge, I'm the Scientific Director of the Division of the National Toxicology Program. I'm Janet Hall, I'm the Clinical Director. Chris Lloyd, Executive Officer. Uh, Lynn Goldman, Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University and Member of Council. Marla Perez Lugo, Member of Council, University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. Gary Cavanaugh, Member of Council, University of Washington. Robin Tangway, Oregon State University. Brad Rosette, Washington University School of Medicine, Member of Council. Ken Fassman, Senior Vice President for Research at the Jackson Laboratory. I'm a former council member and a guest today. Gary Ellison, Chief Environmental Epidemiology Branch in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, the National Cancer Institute. Bob Wright, uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, uh, council member. Katrina Korfmacher, University of Rochester, Department of Environmental Medicine. Edith Parker, University of Iowa College of Public Health, Council Member. Sue Schatz, University of Illinois, and Council Member. C can we ask you to lean a little closer to the mic? Thanks. Yeah, you gotta get close. Good morning, Jose Cordero, University of Georgia, and Council Member. Uh, Jose Manatu, University of Connecticut, and about to become former council member. <laughs> Good morning, Iracema Coronado, Arizona State University. 
Um, I'm Pat Masson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Extramural Research and Training. And we have a microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Good. Oh, you can do the WebEx. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm David Balsha. I'm Chief of the Exposure Response Technology Branch at NIEHS. I'm Bill Sook. I'm uh, Chief of the Hazardous Substances Research Branch and Director of the Superfund Research Program, NIEHS. I'm Jenny Greer, Chief of Grants Management, NIEHS. Hi, Cindy Lawler, Chief of Genes, Environment, and Health Branch. Good morning. I'm Claudia Thompson, Chief of the Population Health Branch, NIEHS. Christy Drew, Chief of the Program Analysis Branch. Good morning, uh, Alfonso Latoni, Chief of the Scientific Review Branch. Welcome, everyone. Lindsay Martin, Population Health Branch. Good morning, Kimberly Gray, Population Health Branch. Sharon Beer, Worker Education and Training Branch. Mark Miller, Chief of Staff, NIEHS. Maureen Avakian, MDB. Heather Henry, Hazardous Substance Research Branch. Uh, ben Encarnacion, Boyer Office. Carolina Medina, Program Analysis Branch. Takara Chamberlain, Population Health Branch. Yu Xiaosui, Exposure Response and Technology Branch. Adam Burkholder, Office of Environmental Science, Cyber Infrastructure. A.B. Boyles, Population Health Branch. Laura Thomas, Scientific Review Branch. Danielle Carlin, Hazardous Substances Research Branch. Demia Wright, Worker Education and Training Branch. Christy Pettibone, Program Analysis Branch. Astrid Haugen, Genes Environment Health Branch. Bonnie Joubert, Population Health Branch. Les Ryan, Exposure Response Technology. Alicia Ramsaran, Genes Environment Health Branch. Annika Gerlinga, Genes Environment and Health Branch. And Kim McAllister, Genes Environment and Health Branch. Linda Bass, Scientific Review Branch. Liz McNair. Ernie Hood, Bridport Services. Michelle Heacock, Hazardous Substance Research Branch. Lingamanaido Ravichandran, Exposure Response and Technology Branch. Leroy Worth, Review. Fred Tyson, Genes Environment and Health Branch. Varsha Shukla, Scientific Review Branch. Charles Schmidt, Office of Data Science. Hi, Chip Hughes. Uh, Worker Education and Training Branch. Carol Schraffler, a Training and Career Development Programs. Dan Shaughnessy, Exposure Response and Technology Branch. Sheila Newton, Director of Policy and Planning. Good morning, Jonathan Halder, Genes Environment and Health Branch. Mike Humble, Genes Environment and Health Branch. Chris Duncan, Genes Environment and Health Branch. Amanda Garten, Genes Environment and Health Branch. Jenny Collins, Exposure Response and Technology Branch. Good morning, Liam O'Fallon, Population Health Branch. John Shelp, Office of Science Education. Thad Shug, Population Health Branch. Stephen Tuishime, Program Analysis Branch. Brittany Trottier, Hazardous Substances Research Branch. Okay, I'm going to ask the people on the uh, WebEx. Andy, can you introduce yourself, please? Andy, sure. Okay, um, Shook May, can you introduce yourself, please? Um, Shook May Ho, um, Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Good morning, everybody. And Bill, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yeah, it's Bill Sabolas. Good morning. I'm the acting director of the Division of Toxicology, NCEHATSDR. And we have a couple of uh, NIH people. Um, Brianne, can you introduce yourself, please? 
This is Brianne Benton, Grants Management Branch. And Martha, are you with us? Yes, Martha Barr, Population Health Branch. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else on WebEx I missed? Okay, if not, thank you. Okay, um, I want to start with a couple of uh, announcements, some housekeeping things. Um, if you need assistance with phone call, travel arrangements, and anything like that, Rose, Rosemary Moody is at the table outside the door here. She can help you. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are webcasting, and so um, it's important that you use your microphone when you're talking, but also important that you turn it off when you're not, because it can pick up side conversations, which you may not want the world to hear. Um, I also, uh, yeah, okay, I'll just say that. Um, you have seen the minutes from September Council. Um, we need to have a motion to approve those minutes. Can I get that motion, please? So moved, second, got a second. Any discussion about the minutes? If not, I will ask you to vote electronically for uh, keeping the minutes. Are we good, Liz? Oh, okay, just a sec. For those on WebEx, we're just having a little trouble getting all our votes in. We good? Okay, thank you all. Um, I'm gonna now turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Wojciech, our acting director, for his report. Well, thanks very much, Pat, and <clears throat> thanks to all of you for being here this morning. It's truly an honor for me as the acting director of NIEHS to have an opportunity to update all of you on many of the exciting things that have been happening at the Institute over the course of the last several months since the last time we met. Uh, that was back in September. 2019 before I started getting about 10,000 emails a second. So let me just start off by uh, talking about a couple of things, and one of them is the, the budget. Uh, there's always a lot of interest in the budget. So we started the fiscal year on October 1st, uh, 2019, without a budget. So we were under what uh, we refer to in the government as a continuing resolution. So we were held to a spending line that was essentially equivalent to what we had last year but with the understanding that we didn't know what the budget was ultimately going to be. I mean, the only thing we know for certain was that the president's request for 2020, which is about 666 million, was a lot less than uh, the budget that was enacted for FY19. So again, it wasn't great news, but fortunately, Congress stepped to the plate. And I can tell you, there is strong bipartisan support in Congress for the work that happens at the NIH and actually the work that happens at NIEHS. So Congress stepped to the plate. They actually passed, passed a budget. And in the end, the NIH as a whole had about a 6.7% increase in the budget. And we here at NIEHS had about a 3.6% increase in the budget. So you might ask, well, wait a minute. If NIH got a 7.6, why are we only getting a 3.6? Well, it turns out that uh, there were a number of programs that Congress wanted to see happen in other ICs across the NIH. We weren't eligible for some of that increased money. But nevertheless, uh, we're 3.6%, which gives us you know, close to $30 million of additional money. And the senior leadership team, together with me, has been working uh, to very carefully figure out how are we going to spend this money wisely, both to support the programs uh, within the intramural divisions, but actually, as I suspect all of you are interested, there's going to be plenty of money to enhance the grant and the contract portfolio to the extramural community. So the other thing I want to point out to you is this is the Superfund uh, allocation here, and the good news is for the first time since 2014, a long time ago, we actually got an increase in the Superfund allocation by $2 million, so we're up about 2.6% which gives us the ability to, to be thinking creatively of how to use some of that additional funding. So overall, we're at a point where it's relatively good news, and just wanted to point out to you that the President's budget was uh, published yesterday, and the 
as seems to be typical of the last several years, the budget is uh, the, the president is proposing a 9 percent decrease for the NIH and a 9 percent decrease for NIEHS. But to rest assured that I, together with other IC directors, will be joining arms and making our way to the Capitol as we are invited and you know, continue to encourage Congress to do what they've done in the past and to really support the outstanding work that's happening at, at the NIH and NIEHS. So let me move on now and actually really address the strategic plan. So I'm a planner. I always like to have a framework of you know, what is it we're doing and to help to define you know, what are we doing, when are we doing it, and how much is it going to cost. So I'm often asked as the acting director when I step to the plate on uh, midnight at October 4, uh, 2019, <laughs> a few weeks ago, uh, what are we going to be doing during the interim period, um, you know, during your, your tenure as the acting director for NIEHS? And my response is that as uh, the deputy director and other members of senior leadership, we worked closely with Linda to update the strategic plan so we have now a strategic plan. You all have heard about this. It takes us through 2023. And I think it's a great strategic plan. I'm actually bought into this. And other members of senior leadership bought into this as well. And I think all of you have bought into this. So we're not going to change course. It's a great plan. It involves three primary themes. The first is advancing environmental health sciences. The second is promoting translation, data to knowledge to action. And the third is enhancing scientific stewardship and support. So since I use this and leadership at NIHS uses this as a framework, I thought I would use this framework of the strategic plan to take you through, uh, through a few things that we've done over the course of the last several months. So let's start with theme one. And theme one fundamentally is about how environmental perturbations can influence the networks and the biological processes that drive human biology. And so today, I'd like to point out and uh, to give a brief summary of some of the work in basic biological research, actually individual susceptibility, and actually work that's being done in our predictive toxicology program. So let me start off and move on here. So the first area of the science advance that I'd like to discuss is work that's happening in Robin Stanley's lab. She is part of the intramural research program here at the, at the NIH, NIEHS campus. And it's really exciting because she's very interested in understanding how are ribosomes assembled. And one of the first critical steps in assembling a ribosome is to actually take that, you know, that precursor RNA, precursor ribosomal RNA, and actually cut it in the appropriate places to be able to produce the, the final products that can be used to assemble ribosomes. Now, what, uh, what Robin knew at the beginning of this work is that there are a couple of enzymes. One of them is called LAS1, which is a nuclease. And that LAS1 nuclease works in concert with a kinase called GRC3. And these two proteins actually form a multimeric protein complex that Robin and her colleagues refer to as RNase PNK or RNase polynucleotide kinase. And what wasn't clear at the beginning of this work is how does the last one nuclease actually hand things off to the kinase to actually accomplish the processing of this primary RNA transcript. So what they decided to do is to go in and determine the structure of this multimeric protein complex. And hopefully the structure would give them some insights into how this handoff was occurring and how the function of this multimeric protein complex was what, what the function was. So the attempt, in my understanding, is uh, for several years to try to crystallize this multimeric protein complex without success. And of course, if you can't crystallize something, you can't use x-ray crystallography. So fortunately, cryo-EM to the rescue. You don't have to crystallize things with cryo-EM. So working together with um, uh, the folks in our, in our uh, Borg, Borg, uh, Borgnia and uh, Robin Stanley working together in our core facilities, uh, they were able to use cryo-EM to map three different functional states of this multimeric protein complex. And overall, they were able to deduce this actually interesting butterfly-like structure. And from this structure, they actually have a model where the, the RNA kind of overlays on top of the kind of the, the butterfly body, you know, the last one, the nuclease. And it actually snips the, the RNA precursor at a specific point 
then it hands it off to either the left or the right kinase. Okay, and something just happened to this monitor over here. I don't know if you guys see that. So it hands it off to the left or the right kinase, and it, it phosphorylates the five prime end, and then you, then you have the mature um, products. So having uh, the structure of this protein was critically important for understanding how the nuclease works in concert with the kinase. Very exciting. I want to take the opportunity to actually call out our scientific director, Dale Zeldin, who actually recognized that you know, bringing in the cryo-EM, and I suspect many of you at your organizations have done some cryo-EM work, and you recognize this is a pricey set of instrumentation. So he cleverly actually joined forces with the administration at the University of North Carolina and the administration at Duke, and we put together a kind of an RTP user facility. So our investigators like Robin could take advantage of these facilities, and we didn't have to foot the entire bill. So uh, in fact, the, you know, once this, this whole technology is really taking off now, so I think part of our challenge is to figure out, well, how do we take it to the next step? And of course, with any instrumentation, you know, it becomes obsolescent in about a couple of years, and you have to start thinking about, well, how do we find the, the multi-million dollar budget to support the uh, upgrading of the technology? Anyway, very exciting. The other thing I want to point out is some recent work that's uh, been done by uh, Dimitri Gordain in our intramural research program. In fact, this is work that was published recently in Nature. In fact, it was uh, a featured article in the Nature that was delivered to my home by U.S. Mail on Saturday morning. So this is very fresh, hot off the press. So what Dimitri is doing is working together with a large collection of investigators across the globe and they're analyzing tumors. But they're doing this not by looking just at H&E stains of tissue sections or looking at transcriptional profiling or proteomics profiling. They're going in and sequencing the entire genome. And what they were able to do then is use some very sophisticated uh, bioinformatics tools to look at what they're referring to as mutational signatures. And different types of tumors have different mutational signatures that are giving them remarkable insights into the mutagenic mechanisms that are ultimately leading to human cancer. Very, very exciting work. So it's no longer just about doing an h and &E section, slicing and dicing, and taking a look at it. So this is bringing another whole element of analysis of, of tumors that we hope to be able to then bring to this whole effort to, uh, to establish precision medicine. But I also want to point out that within our division of the National Toxicology Program, Arun Pandiri, Ron Herbert, Robert Sills, and their colleagues, together with Alan Balmain at UCSF and his colleagues at the Sanger Center, have actually been doing a number of experiments where they've been looking at mutational signatures in tumors arising in the rodent uh, models that we've used in the, the division of the National Toxicology Program for many years. And interestingly, what they're finding is that the mutational signatures in some of these tumors appear to correlate with the agents, the environmental agents that were used to trigger the tumors. So it raises the whole very interesting prospect that eventually if you develop cancer, you may be able to look at the transcriptional profile as well as the, the mutational signature and to better understand what, in, what things in the environment might have been responsible for triggering the tumor, tumor genetic event. So very exciting work. Uh, I also want to talk about some of the work in the Division of the National Toxicology Program. And so one of the challenges when we, we try to establish safety associated with different commercial products, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's relatively simple if you're looking at benzene or if you're looking at one chemical species of PFAS like PFOA. Okay, the more complicated issue is how do you look at complex mixtures of things where you may not know what the active ingredient is, or you may not know what the chemical components are that could lead to potential toxicities. So the, the uh, NTP is very interested in developing the tools to establish safety. So to do this, they've actually decided to look at a couple of botanical supplements. One of them is called black cohash, which is a supplement, if you actually do a Google search, and it's a supplement that actually does lots of different things, but I think it's most notable in that it, it's a supplement associated with um, gynecological health. And uh, another supplement, which is a complex mixture, is echinacea, and that's associated with promoting uh, positive immune responses. 
But the challenge was to figure out, well, um, you know, are these, are these things safe? So what they did was actually came up with a, a couple of different uh, strategies. One of them was to develop an HPLC profile, a chemical profile. And the other is to actually look at a, say, a biological response profile. So they took sandwich cultures of primary human hepatophytes, the SC, SCPHH, and they looked at the expression of five different toxicological relevant nuclear receptors. And what you can see here, so an open box means that there wasn't a correlation with their standard, and a black box means that it looked like the, you know, the standard that they were using uh, within their laboratories. And you know, many of them, many of the independent samples that they purchased at uh, different uh, commercial uh, suppliers, you know, did correlate reasonably well, but there were a number where the, the non-targeted chemistry, the HPLC profile looked similar to their standards, but the, uh, the, the gene expression profile did not, and vice versa with others. So I think the bottom line here is that the analysis of complex mixtures is difficult. And you probably want to go through and not do just an HPLC profile. This is pretty remarkable. If you're interested, read the paper that came out. I mean, some of these, uh, the, some of these products that are, quote, uh, efficacious look very different in terms of their chemical comp composition. So it's, we have to be thinking more and more about how do we do these mixtures analysis and really focus on the fact that lots of things in the environment, we've got to figure out how do we establish safety associated with these complex um, complex real world mixtures. So anyway, very interesting work. The last thing I want to highlight here is the whole issue of vaping and actually what we come, have come to refer to as ENDS. So these are the electronic nicotine delivery systems. So I mean, many of you, it's been in the news and I can tell you Congress is very interested in asking the, the NIH to step to the plate and try to figure out what the heck is going on. You know, why do you have teenagers using these devices, you know, de dying from this or developing these severe you know, lung injuries? So one of our uh, grantees at uh, Baylor is uh, Dr. Kermand, uh, actually did a number of experiments to try to tease apart what is it in these end products that are likely to be causing these adverse health effects. So one of the first experiments they did in her laboratory was to actually compare what happens in C57 black 6 J, can just for you, J, uh, mice, <laughs> J means Jackson. Uh, and what they found is that the adverse health effects associated with standard tobacco smoke is just very different than the adverse health effects that you see in the lungs of uh, animals that are, uh, where, where they're using these ENDS products. And interestingly, what they found is that it's not the nicotine. Actually, uh, so those of you who may know, when the, the students at Stanford originally came up with the whole concept of these ENDS products, they had to chemically modify nicotine because nicotine in its raw form is actually very abrasive. So your, your body is telling you after you smoked a few standard cigarettes, okay, it's enough, I can't take anymore. But what they did was chemically modify the nicotine so it's not so abrasive. So these kids using these ENDS products are getting huge doses of nicotine. Although this set of experiments suggested that it's not the nicotine that's actually causing these adverse health effects. And interestingly, in the end, it looks like things like the polyethylene glycol, you know, the vegetal gly uh, glycerol, or potentially even some of the flavor components may be causing these adverse health effects. So how is that possible? I mean, maybe it's, you know, banana flavor or cinnamon flavor. These things have been approved for the FDA forever. The problem is they were approved for ingestion. They weren't improved for inhalation. So there's a problem and we're continuing to, to tease this apart. So um, hopefully we'll make some progress on this and better understand what are the potential deleterious effects of these ENDS uh, products. So let me move on now to, th I wanna uh, make sure that I provide plenty of time for questions and answers this morning. So let me move on to, to theme two. So theme two is about you know, taking the information that we develop as part of our theme one and actually putting this to work for the benefit of the public health community. So getting out there, telling people about what it is that we're doing, hopefully energizing them and changing their lives, changing their behaviors in such a way that our science can, can improve overall public health. 
So what I want to do is just give a few examples of the work that we're doing on outreach, communications, and engagement as part of theme two, as well as some of the partnerships for action. So again, we want to partner with groups so we can put our science to work for the benefit of public health. So the first thing I want to do is just point out that there have been a number of interactions with uh, either congressional interactions, in-person meetings, or telebriefings. So on September 24th, uh, the last week that Linda was directed was a very busy week for her. So one of the things she did do was she visited with Congressman Vern Buchanan from Florida. Now Vern has a number of coastal communities in Florida, and there are a number of seniors who live in those coastal communities. There's a lot of interest in like upper respiratory disease, things like uh, liver cancer and medical disorders. And so he was very interested in better understanding how harmful algal blooms may, algal blooms may be influencing the health of his constituents. So Linda had a chance together with uh, Aubrey Miller, who was in our uh, office of the director of Bethesda office to brief them on the work that we're doing with HABs. On October 11th, uh, there was a, a bipartisan staff meeting with representatives from <coughs> NIHS and several ICs across the NIH where we had a chance to brief Congress on the work that's being done to address this issue around deleterious and adverse effects associated with e-cigarettes. And Fred Tyson was the person who represented NIEHS, and he actually brought to their attention, you know, these flavor components. You know, there are potential toxicities associated with them, and you've got to be careful. Okay, but it may not be just flavor components. I and mean, some of the other, quote, inert ingredients in these, um, in these ENDS products uh, may have danger. In fact, one of the other remarkable things is Ilona Jaspers, who is one of our grantees at the University of North Carolina, you know, gave a spectacular uh, presentation at uh, a recent meeting. And she's been out uh, interacting with students using these, these vaping devices. And they actually think that they're breathing in water vapor. You know, it's just truly remarkable. They don't have a, a good understanding that there is nicotine in there. So what they're finding, there are pediatricians now who are finding they have 14-year-olds that are addicted to nicotine and there's really nothing they can do. All of these nicotine or the smoking cessation products that are in the market haven't been approved for pediatric use. So it's a real bind that we're in. So we've got to do something about this. And first step is doing some communication. Also, Michael Cast Castellona from the House Oversight and Reform Committee was a meeting with Kim Gray. And you know, Kim, uh, he was very interested in better understanding uh, the role of particulate matter and air pollution, especially indoor air pollution, as it relates to children's environmental health. A lot of interest in children's environmental health on the Hill. And uh, we have a number of very strong and interactive programs dealing with that issue. Uh, Dr. Kuse Merchant, uh, who is on the House Appro uh, Committee on Appropriations, the Subcommittee on Interior and Environment, visited with us at NIEHS recently, and actually I had the honor to host him in my office, welcome him to the Institute, and actually he started off by asking me, what can I do for you? I said, wow, that's great. Um, well, there are a number of things. First of all, thank you for that increase in the Superfund uh, budget this year, and uh, maybe if what you're hearing here, you might be so inclined to increase the budget in future years. So anyway, Gwen Coleman and members of the Superfund Research Program provided him with a, and, and the worker training program, provided him with a very thorough analysis of the, of the different programs that we have underway at NIEHS. <clears throat> and by the way, actually, he's a real supporter of the NIH. Turns out he did, he's a structural biologist, and he did his postdoc in one of the intramural laboratories at NIDDK. So actually, we can train these people, send them off to Congress, and you know, there might be a little positive feedback at the end. So the last thing I want to point out here is that Allison McReynolds from Congressman Ken Calvert's staff was meeting together with Mary Wolf and with Warren Casey, and she was very interested in better understanding you know, the ICVAM approach and how we're using animals for toxicology testing. We were very happy to brief her on the work that's ongoing. So I had the honor to actually give a presentation to a group called Friends of NIEHS. Uh, this happened just a couple of weeks ago in Washington at their annual meeting. And this is a group of both patient advocates 
and research support groups. So it's co-chaired by Nuala Moore, who is uh, a member of the Thoracic Society, and by, um, by, by, okay, help me out here, by um, Joe Lasko of the, the Endocrine Society. Sorry, Joe. And uh, so we had a great meeting. So I was able to tell them about the work that we do, starting off with, say, light at night and the potential risks associated with obesity. And also talked about some of the work that was recently published on you know, genital uh, powder. Uh, so I also talked about some of the work that we're doing in the D D Division of the National Toxicology Program about evaluating some of these chemical entities of PFAS, perfluorinated alkyl substances. You know, it's remarkable. There are like 4,800 different chemical species you know, that have been spawned from the Teflon um, era. And we don't know a lot about the toxicity associated with these things. So actually, the National Toxicology Program stepped to the plate and is doing some very interesting work, very well received by the friends of NIEHS. So it was a great meeting. And as a result of these sorts of interactions with our friends, they opened the door for us to actually do some congressional briefings. So one of the uh, opportunities that they provided for us was for Linda last year to brief a bipartisan panel in Congress on the work that's happening in child, uh, children's, uh, uh, children's environmental health. So Linda gave an overview of the work that's happening at uh, NIHS. Uh, Joe Brown uh, talked about his work on PFAS, perfluorinated alkyl substances, and, the, and developmental exposures. And Nadia Hansel from Johns Hopkins University uh, talked about indoor air quality and childhood asthma. So last November, uh, we had an opportunity to brief, again, Congress on the work that's happening on PFAS. So Mark Miller, our acting, or the chief of staff, not the acting chief of staff, the chief of staff in the office of the director at NIHS, is a toxicologist, has a lot of experience with, with PFAS. So he briefed the, the group, the congressional group, on the work that's happening, that's sponsored by NIHS on PFAS. Abby Fleisch from Maine Medical Center Research Institute in Portland uh, talked about the work uh, that she's doing around PFAS and bone health and the development of obesity. And Jian Liu from Yale uh, talked about the work that he's doing around the adverse health effects associated with developmental exposures to PFAS. So I think overall, a lot of interest in PFAS, and, uh, and there should be. I mean, these are these chemical entities. These are what uh, you know, toxicologists refer to as the forever chemicals. You know, Teflon's going to be on the face of the earth uh, forever. And uh, we, we have plenty of data to suggest that there are adverse health effects associated with Teflon, you know, C8 Teflon. And by the way, if you haven't seen the movie, I strongly recommend it. It's Dark Waters. It's actually, I think it's still in the movie theaters, but it's a pretty sobering um, exposure of corporate irresponsibility around you know, the production of chemicals and exposing workers at some of these production plants to um, on you unusual exposures that can uh, impact their health. So the other thing I want to point out is that NIHS will be hosting, it's called the TAC, or the NIH, uh, NIH Tribal Advisory Committee. This will be happening March 26th and 27th, uh, just coming up in a few weeks, in the Rod Bell ABC. So that's the new renovated Rod Bell. So the next time we meet, we'll actually be in this fresh new place. And I'll have the honor to discuss the support, NIEHS support for the tribal environmental health. There are a number of other topics they want to talk about around tribal, uh, the tribal consultation policy. It's been a little uh, complicated in how members of tribal communities actually enroll in, say, the All of Us program or the Yanko program. And we're going to have them to NIH. And Larry Tabak, the, uh, the primary deputy director of the NIH, will be there to help to negotiate uh, some of these issues. We'll also have a couple of our grantees uh, presenting uh, Jani Ingram from Northern Arizona University and Annie Belcourt from the University of Montana will, will be there to talk about the work that's happening in their laboratories. So let me move on now to theme three. And theme three is about enhancing environmental health sciences through stewardship and support. So it's paying attention to both the personnel and some of the resources that are necessary to make sure that it, in environmental health sciences happens and happens efficiently. And I want to focus the, in the time that I have on the issue of profession, the professional pipeline. 
So how do we get people uh, involved in environmental health sciences work? How do we recruit them and how do we reward them? So let me just give you a few vignettes here that uh, I think we're, we've been very successful in, in making this happen. First thing I'd like to point out is that we were able to recruit Annette Parekh, who was previously a professor of physiology and the director of the Center of Integrated Physiology at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Merton College. Uh, he is recruited and actually is on site. Uh, he is a senior investigator and the deputy chief working together with John Sadlowski in the signal transduction uh, laboratory. Uh, so he actually, his area of study is calcium signal transduction with cells, which fits very nicely within the whole theme of the signal transduction lab. But it's not just senior investigators that we're recruiting. Uh, we have also recently recruited Elizabeth Janeska, who got her PhD in chromatin biology and epigenetics from Rockefeller and just finished a postdoc at the Pickauer Institute for Learning and Memory at MIT. So she will be joining the Neurobiology Laboratory as a primary appointment, and she will have secondary appointments in the uh, Epigenetics and Stem Cell Biology Laboratory. Uh, her expertise is chromatin and neurobiology, and she's really interested in looking at how genes are regulated in microglia and how microglia, microglia can malfunction in Alzheimer's disease. It's a very exciting recruitment. Also, I'd like to point out that uh, once we recruited tenure track investigators, we nurture them and provide them with the resources to be successful. And you know, many of them actually at the NIH will actually achieve tenure. So I want to note that uh, Patricia or, or Tricia uh, Jensen was recently awarded tenure by the NIH, uh, NIH Central Tenure Committee. So she received her PhD in anatomy and neurobiology at the University of Tennessee, postdoc at St. Jude's. She's been with us for several years and as a and I can personally say is a terrific collaborator. So we've actually created a, a knockout of one neuron-specific isoform of PGC1-alpha, and she has been a very engaged and active collaborator to figure out what are the consequences of knocking out the specific isoform of this gene in the brain. So a great collaborator and a terrific scientist. The other thing I want to point out to you, all of you, is that we've recently and hopefully you've heard this in, in the news, we've recently recruited uh, Joel Kaufman uh, to, to be the next editor-in-chief of Environmental Health Perspectives. So Joel is a professor of environmental and occupational health sciences, and medicine, and epidemiology at the University of Washington. So this time around, we decided to use the more traditional academic model to recruit an editor-in-chief. So we're actually looking at someone, so Terry, thanks for sharing your colleague with us. Um, at, uh, at environmental health perspectives, but to, to bring in someone who is a world-renowned expert, a notable uh, person who interacts with the environmental health sciences community, bring them in to provide strategic leadership of where is the journal going. And he recognized there are a number of things that we have to, uh, so, I mean, a number of very exciting directions for the journal, there's a number of things that have to be fixed. And I'll be working together with actually a pretty talented staff at, uh, NIE, uh, at the, at the uh, EP, uh, Environmental Health Perspectives, most notably a Chief Operating Officer, Sean Holleron, and the Senior Science Editor, Jane Schroeder, to actually make some things happen. So we're very excited to have him uh, with us. He started officially on February 1st, and I just emailed him with him last night, and I think he's still smiling, and uh, he's pretty excited about uh, some of the possibilities. So the other thing I want to do is acknowledge that uh, Linda Birnbaum, who you all know, we actually celebrated her successes as the former director of NIEHS. She has earned the distinction as scientist emeritus. Uh, that was approved uh, by NIH um, leadership, and she will continue to, uh, to conduct research in the uh, division of the National Toxicology Program. And I do want to note that we will have a special a research symposium to celebrate Linda's uh, accomplishments and her legacy on April 6th in the new Rod Bell Auditorium. We may even have a special, um, um, uh, well, actually, you'll have to show up and, and uh, we may have a special surprises for you. So the other thing I want to recognize is uh, Dr. Trevor Archer, who is the chief of the Epigenetics and Stem Cell Biology Laboratory, was recently selected as an NIH Distinguished Investigator. So what does that mean? I mean, it's a high honor. It recognizes 
the work that Trevor has been doing in the areas of chromatin regulation of gene expression, and more recently he's been very interested in understanding the epigenetic uh, drivers that contribute to human embryonic stem cell pluripotency. But this is a remarkable accomplishment. So in the history of NIEHS, there have been two people so he's the second that's been awarded this, this honor. And across the NIH, with you know, hundreds of principal investigators, only 2% of them actually achieved this level of distinction. So it's a pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable achievement, and we're very proud of uh, Trevor for the work that he's done in support of en uh, environmental health sciences. So the other thing I want to point out is that our own Stella Sieber was a biologist in the Signal Transduction Laboratory has been truly a remarkable individual. So I need to tell you just briefly a story. So her life changed pretty dramatically. I think it was on July 29th, 2001. She was on her way back from Washington with her cousin, and they stopped at the side of the road to help a motorist that was in trouble. There was actually a crash. And unfortunately, there was an out-of-control motorist that actually hit her and crushed her legs. So her life has changed. She went through a very grueling recovery period, but she has been out there and advocating for limb loss and limb difference in the community. And in fact, on top of all of this adversity in her life, she is one of the most pleasant people to interact with. I mean, I've never seen her without a smile on her face. So that's something for all of us to emulate. And uh, this is the type of person that I think really um, emulates the spirit of working at NIEHS. So it was a remarkable uh, honor for her to be uh, awarded this, um, this, this honor. The other thing I want to do is to point out that a couple of our grantees, uh, Dr. Peter Didon and uh, Eric Elm at the MIT, were recently awarded the NIH Director's Transformative Research Award. And this is for their work on studying the influence of the microbiome on regulating gene expression through epigenetic mechanisms. And I actually want to point out, Eric Elm gave a, just a terrific overview on the work that he's doing at a recent SOT workshop. And so in addition to the basic science work around the epigenetic control of gene expression, he's also engaged with his colleagues to create um, your resources, your microbiome resources for, so for people who have suffered from C. diff infections. It's the fecal transfers that are uh, almost, I think in 95% of the cases, are actually a cure for the devastating diarrhea that can action. People can die from this. So he's actually stepped to the plate and he's really translated the basic research that he, do, that he does for the benefit of the, the biomedical and the environmental health sciences community. Truly remarkable. So I also want to um, just point out to you at the upcoming SOT meeting, and I suspect many of you are going to plan to be there, uh, there will be all of the traditional featured sections, uh, sessions and symposia and workshops. But I do want to point out that on Monday, March 16th, from 11 to 1230, there will be a special session uh, honoring Linda on her retirement as the NIHS director and really to pay tribute to her for her substantial accomplishments in her long career in research and public service. So if you're at SOT, hope to see you there. So I also want to point out that we're going to be hosting an event, a very interesting event at uh, NIEHS on Tuesday, February 18th. So if you're in the local area, and if you're very interested in music, and you're very interested to know why is it that when you listen to music, your brain actually changes? I don't know about you, but when I go to the North Carolina Symphony, even if I'm in a bad mood, I go in, I actually come out you know, feeling completely different. You know, music does remarkable things to brain chemistry. Actually, my wife often refers to this as its music is like mental floss. So it just cleans things up, and it's just so refreshing. So we're. Uh, John Shelp, in our Office of, uh, of Science, Education, and Diversity, has arranged for the jo uh, jazz bassist, uh, John Brown, who's on the faculty at Duke, uh, to perform. And then once John has performed, uh, John has asked Richard Mooney, who is a neuroscientist who studies brain chemistry and the impact of music and the brain, to lead a discussion, a panel discussion, about why is it that after 
John Brown's presentation, we all feel kind of different. So as I think it's, a, it's potentially a very exciting event, and I encourage you to attend. So the other thing I want to point out to you is that on July 1st in 2020 in the Rod Bill, the renovated Rod Bill Auditorium, uh, John Balbus, who is um, a, one of our senior advisors in the office of the director in Bethesda, and he's our primary um, liaison to the global environmental health sciences community. And they're going to be putting on, it's called the annual Global Environmental Health Day 2020. And this is all about bringing increased awareness to the the scientists and the staff at the NIEHS campus in Raleigh-Durham, but also just increasing awareness of the impact of the work that NIEHS does and the, the things that are happening in the global environmental health community. This year's focus is going to be on uh, global environmental change and health, uh, climate change, and the impact on, on public health. And the keynote speaker would be Har um, Howard Frumkin from the University of Washington. So if you're so inclined, I encourage you to, to come to the event. So let me pause for a second, just ask for a time check. Pat, how am I doing? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. I can't hear you, so how much time? I have what? 20 minutes, 20 minutes left, okay, perfect, right on time. So there are um, a few other things that I want to point out to you. So one of my last official jobs as the deputy director of NIHS was to represent NIEHS at a, a trans-NIH meeting, kind of an organizational meeting, that Francis Collins and Eric Lander called. It was at the Bolger Center in the middle of September. And this was actually about launching this new program that they refer to as the International Common Disease Alliance. So what this is about is that Eric Lander got up to the podium and said, you know, we're now a post-genome project. We have these powerful technologies where we can sequence a human genome for less than $1,000. And we've been doing GWAS experiments. We have 60,000 different GWAS hits with you know, remarkable p-values. But many of them are with introns, within introns, or in intergenic spacer regions. So how do they work? You know, how are they impacting human health? And furthermore, how do we take this information, you know, GWAS to understanding mechanisms, how do we get it to the clinic? So they actually came up with this uh, concept of M to M to M. So M is about mapping to mechanisms to medicine. So I tried to point out to them, actually NIHS doesn't really do medicine, we do public health, can we change it to public health? And I think uh, Francis says, you know, the mouthfeel on M to M to M is a lot better than M to M to PH. So anyway, so he's the director of the institute. But for, for me, this was actually pretty exciting because it was really an attempt, it's, I think what, uh, what um, Francis and Eric were talking about is really kind of Genome Project 2.0. So how can we take all of these powerful genome tools and actually have a bigger impact in both the biomedical and the public health communities and doing specific things? And you may recall that Kim uh, McAllister at our meeting last September actually described a set of experiments that fit very nicely within that second large M. So in fact, when I was listening to Eric at this meeting, I thought, gee, you know, Kim could have been giving that presentation. So it seemed like there was pretty good alliance. And this idea of actually beginning to look at complex traits was pretty exciting because most of the gene by environment effects that we study as part of the environmental health community are not single Mendelian traits, they're complex traits. So at the, the morning session, I raised my hand and said, okay, everyone's talking about hypertension, you know, dyslipidemia, all of these medical conditions. Where's the environment? And Eric Lander looked at me and said, well, how do you measure the environment? Well, you know, we need to actually be at the table. We, we actually know how to do this. We've been doing it for a while. So he said, well, put fingers to the keyboard. You know, get some, uh, get some information about the environment into this emerging white paper. So when I got back, actually Richard Kwok, who's the acting um, uh, chief of staff in the office of director, assembled a group of investigators from across the different divisions at NIHS. We put fingers to the keyboard and put some language around the environment into this emerging white paper. So we're not sure what's going to happen with this. Gwen Coleman has uh, graciously agreed to fly to Copenhagen uh, next month uh, to represent NIEHS at the discussions that will be happening 
uh, for this International Common Disease Alliance. So stay tuned. I think it's a, a real uh, potentially exciting opportunity to actually take the environmental sciences over here and the, the genome scientists over here and actually having some intersection. Wow, what a concept. So uh, very, very exciting for us. So the other thing I want to point out is that you've heard of the All of Us program. So this is the million person cohort that Francis Collins and others um, are very excited about. In fact, at, the, at this meeting at the Bolger Center for the ICDA, I actually I met Kelly Gibo, who's the chief medical officer for the All of Us, and I talked about the exposome mm -hmm. and the concepts and the things that we talk about. And she emailed me during the meeting and said, wow, pretty exciting, you know, can I learn more about this? So I actually uh, met with her and uh, talked about the possibility of better integrating the work that we do at NIHS. And Jan Hall has been our representative on the All of Us. Uh, up to this point, you know, Kelly kind of explained, you know, they've had some serious challenges putting together this million person cohort with lots of genetic and uh, phenotypic diversity, but they're actually tearing into it now. So I think next week there's going to be a meeting in Bethesda where we're going to start talking about the environmental exposure and occupational health module. So many of you may know that Eric Dishman, he gave a presentation to council, uh, I think a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's, you know, it's sad, you know, he had cancer, they sequenced his genome, actually found a, a therapeutic target. He's alive today because of genome science. But he's absolutely convinced that his, I just spoke with him two days ago, and he's absolutely convinced that his cancer was attr attributable to an environmental exposure when he was a kid. So he's absolutely on board with the whole notion that there are environmental exposures that may predispose to the development of cancer. And so us getting in there and working with this group, because the bottom line is people get sick, not just because they have allelic variants in their genomes that they, hired, uh, that they inherited from their parents, but because they're exposed to bad things in the environment that can trigger deleterious health effects. Okay, so just in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over just a couple of things here. Uh, I do wanna you know, comment that uh, after my first day on the job on October 4th at 5 p.m., I sent out an all hands message to thank people for their um, your trust in me you know, as the, the acting director. And I also encourage them, if there's anyone who's interested in having kind of a town hall listening session, I'd be happy to meet with you and talk things over. And specifically, I'm interested in knowing you know, what are the things under Linda's leadership that you thought uh, were good for the Institute and you want to make sure that Rick doesn't break and stop doing. And the other thing is, uh, are there things that you think that I can address during my tenure as acting director that can have a positive impact and to set the Institute up in a positive way for the, the next permanent director? So actually, there was pretty overwhelming response to that request. So I've now had 34 different uh, listening sessions. Uh, it's, it's actually been great. Uh, so I've been uh, interacting with, with the staff in very productive ways. And in fact, I've also carved out uh, part of my Friday afternoons to continue to kind of walk around the Institute and meet with people in situ, in their offices, in their laboratories, and just listen to what's on their mind. Actually, I did this when I was at the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, and that's uh, actually, it's a great way to stay in touch with the, the things that are at the science and the, the work that's happening at the Institute. So again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through. We've gotten lots of different input. And uh, in my first all hands meeting a few weeks ago, we've uh, actually committed to you know, taking up the things that we heard. And then actually I had all members of leadership join me in front of the, the all hands meeting. And we talked about, this is what we heard, this is what we're doing about it. So we're committed to actually addressing all of the things that have come up in these listening sessions. Okay, the last thing I wanna do just very briefly is introduce the, really the subject matter for much of the rest of this meeting today. And it's really about data science. So I often introduce this by saying it used to be relatively simple. Just a few years ago, uh, if you were a PI in a lab, you'd pull out your lab notebook, you'd take out your pen, kind of record your data, and with some regularity, you kind of pull it all together, send it off to publication, and you share your information in the published literature. So now, of course, we do one experiment you know, in the exposome. We're looking at you know, thousands of different potential chemicals. So we have real challenges around data management, data archiving, and most importantly, data sharing. So one of the problems that we had when I first got to the Institute in 2011 is that we weren't developing plans 
for how do we manage our, our cyber infrastructure, our IT infrastructure, and what is our plan for data management? Do we actually build the, the, the data storage uh, capabilities in-house, or do we go to, the, go to the cloud? And the plans weren't being developed because it was no one's job to do that. So if you want to get something done, charge someone with doing it. And so many of you may recall David Fargo, who's the new chief of our, our, our cyber infrastructure, uh, gave you an overview of what we put together at NIEHS. We now have people uh, whose job it is to develop these plans. And then David's job is to actually integrate these plans together and figure out what are we going to do, when are we going to do it, and how much is it going to cost. So anything you do with cyber infrastructure is pricey. Not quite as pricey as that cry OEM, but it's actually pretty pricey. So anyway, I'm not going to uh, go further on this other than to say that um, actually there's been a lot of exciting things that are happening. It's actually been really a, an, a, an adrenaline-inducing time for me as the acting director at NIEHS. And uh, I want to thank uh, Tiffany Bowen and Sheila Newton, Richard Kwok, and Christine Flowers for the help uh, assembling you know, the slides that I just showed you. They were just invaluable uh, colleagues in pulling all this together. And um, actually, what I have to do is leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, and if there's actually time, if you don't have other questions, I'd like to engage in the listening session. Are there things that uh, you want to make sure that I don't break uh, over the course of my tenure as a uh, as acting director, or are there things specifically you, you want to take up? So uh, let me end at this point, thank all of you for your attention, and open it up for general questions. <laughs> Who'd like to go first? Or should I call on you? <laughs> yes. So first and foremost, thank you for oh, that. So this um, is Shukmay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Shukmay, do you want to go first? And then Lynn, you're next. Um, I, I, I'm going to do that. Ray, I think thank you very much for your stewardship uh, during this period. Um, it was just amazing and outstanding. And I want to really thank you for that. And the presentation was exceptional. One thing I was uh, wondering is that how we can actually utilize um, or participate more in this M2M2M program, which I think will be very transformative. Yeah, so well, for, first of all, thanks for the comments. And actually, it's part of my job as the acting director to step in once the, the permanent director retires or moves on or does other things. So I'm, I'm happy to do this. And it's, it's just been very exciting for me. Um, I feel it's really pretty, pretty much been a seamless transition of power. Uh, Yolinda and I work very close together, and it was just very inspiring working with her. So with respect to the M to M to M, I mean, the first thing is that we're just trying to get uh, very serious visibility in this community. And the, what I perceived at this meeting at the Bolger Center is, again, you had the genome scientists who were just, just not aware of the, the things that were happening. So I you know, pointed out to them, look, you know, people get sick. I mean, asbestos. Um, actually, that I also pointed out the, the work that uh, our uh, D Division of the National Toxicology Program did with diacetyl, butter-flavored popcorn. Okay, so there are chemical entities in the environment that can actually cause deleterious health effects and it has nothing to do, for the most part, with sequence variations in genes in their genome. So I think that we caught their attention. And uh, I've been interacting with people at NHGRI who have been leading some of the cross-NIH uh, coordina coordination effort. But I think the next step is that Gwen will be at the uh, ICDA um, Coordinating Committee meeting in Copenhagen. And I know that she's going to be in there uh, interacting in panel discussions, bringing the environment to light. And as this continues to mature, we're, we'll you know, continue to keep uh, all of the environmental health sciences community uh, in sync. Uh, the other thing, too, it just uh, is another comment, uh, there's a lot of work that's going on now to coalesce the exposome efforts throughout the world community. And in my mind, it's like, wow, talk about perfect timing. You know, we have these people now talking about the next phase of the genome project. And then you have people who are looking at the totality of exposure. So that's exactly what the genome people have been looking for. You know, how do you measure the environment? Well, great question. We'll show you how. It's actually part of this, this exposome project. 
And so, um, you know, we, as I'm sure many of you know, have been very active in the whole Exposome project. And Gary Miller and his uh, collaborators had a terrific uh, summary article in Science a couple of weeks ago, which I suspect many of you have seen. And, you know, we as a community have to better define what is the Exposome and how can we be interfacing with the genetics and genomics communities. Shuk, may does that answer your question? It does, but uh, at the same time, I want to add uh, that our vision for medicine has been shifting from correction to prevention. And so I think we do participate in medicine. Right. Well, so the one thing we did do, and um, I mean, I'm happy to distribute the, the version of the white paper in, in part of the, the environmental exposures, really bringing to the fore the whole issue of you know, prevention. I mean, the, the best way to actually cure cancer is to prevent that from happening in the first place. So just increasing the awareness that there's an important role, a public health role, uh, that we focus on at NIEHS that we can bring to the discussions with other ICs and other organizations. So why don't we move on? Linda, do you, you. Have, do you have a question or a comment? Well, in, it, to some extent, it's, it's in the same area. But first, I also wanted to uh, congratulate you for this very high energy presentation. And um, I just think that the, um, the institute couldn't be in better hands as in, for an interim director. You're Great. really, you. really right out in front of a lot of things. So I appreciate that. Um, I, um, I'm very involved on the advisory committee for the ECHO study. Mm -hmm. And I've been very aware of, you know, there's, there's ECHO, which has a lot of environmental health, environment is in its name, mm -hmm. and there's also the All of Us, and I'm delighted to hear that you're bringing or, or working to bring the Exposome work that NIEHS mm -hmm. does into that. I, I think that it's, there's a lot of investment that's being made out of these programs that are coming out of the NIH director's office which, which, in my view, has had way too little collaboration with the NIEHS, and mm -hmm. I applaud you for getting involved. And I would say, you know, on behalf of the committee that I chair for ECHO, that we, we have tried to, um, you know, influence mm -hmm. uh, the director's um, committee um, in this direction, and we would do anything we can to try to, to push this. It's just a wasted opportunity if, there, oh, totally if the agree. best science isn't brought mm -hmm. to bear. Right. Um, and then these, these two yeah. large cohort efforts. So uh, thank you for doing that. And mm -hmm. um, so, so actually it's, it's, it's my pleasure to be reaching out to other influential individuals running programs like Matt Gilman um, and Francis Collins and others talking about the role of the environment. In fact, the, the primary focus of my traveling has been up to Bethesda over the last several weeks and meeting with other institute directors and inviting them back to our campus and making them aware of this. Uh, so I actually with, uh, met with Bruce Tromberg, who's the new director of NIBIB. Actually, they're doing some remarkable work in developing, well, looking at um, the informatics of, of analyzing scanned images, uh, which may be very applicable to some of the work that we're doing in the National Toxicology Program, building 3D models. I also met with Elena Langevin, who is the new director of uh, the National Center for Complementary and um, IH, um, pardon me? Integrated Health. Integ integrated Health. Sorry, I, I always remember as the old name. But she is terrific and uh, very interested in nutrition. We had dinner just a few days ago, and I think she's pretty fired up about the prospect of joining forces with uh, investigators and staff at NIEHS. So we're going to have here for a visit uh, as well. And uh, so I actually met Matt, uh, met Matt at dinner. Uh, he said, Rick, you know, it's pretty interesting. He said, you know, it's been a while since I've been there. Where are you going to invite me back? I said, OK, um, we're going to invite you back. In fact, when he's back, we're going to have him meet with counsel. And the time that looks the best to do this is going to be in September. So Matt will be here talking about ECHO, talking about uh, integration with the, the programs that we're doing. And plus, uh, you know, being the acting uh, IC director, I actually have access to Francis. So I've been trying to, you know, kind of tickle him <laughs> with a few things that we're doing, um, especially in, in regard to the um, ICDA. And can we bring you know, the exposome in the environment, actually, and get some intersection with the things I know that he's very interested in. 
So prior to the one of the IC directors recently, uh, IC directors meeting, I actually you know, pulled them aside and we talked about things. And, you know, Francis, you know, we're we're really working. We put fingers to the keyboard, integrated the environment into the white paper for the ICDA, and he said, and don't forget about the All of Us program. I said, great. And in fact, I told, I told him, I said, I met with Kelly Gibo. She's very interested. And so I, you know, I think you know, with time, hopefully we can kind of nurture these relationships, get some interest. And you know, in the end, we want to be doing things, not, not just the things Francis wants us to do, but things that make sense to the environmental health sciences community. But I think there's some just huge opportunities to bring increased visibility to the work that we're doing at NIHS. And, and that's, I can just uh, reassure you that that's going to be the primary focus of my meeting with other IC directors, staff, and the other ICs across the NIH, and just you know, letting them know about the tremendously exciting things we're doing. And as you can probably tell, I'm pretty fired up about the work that we do. And so it's uh, pretty easy to meet with others and try to you know, you know, engage them in very positive ways. Does that answer your question? Great. Other comments? Jose. Just, just quickly, Rick. Uh, thank you for a phenomenal presentation. I really uh, enjoy uh, the presentation. Um, so the Botanical Consortium, that's actually quite interesting. And we're working with HESI. Uh, HESI is a partner on this uh, memorandum of understanding. So uh, the safety issue of botanicals is really uh, important. We're talking about mixtures, right? Uh, and that's something that uh, is important to uh, address. It's a uh, area that hasn't received the attention from a safety t standpoint that is needed. So I look forward to continued uh, uh, interactions between, I guess it's NIHS, HESI, and the FDA. Those are the. So we'll find a way to get you back here with some regularity now that yeah, you have this yeah, extra yeah. time uh, for retiring yeah. from council. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then in addition to, uh, uh, so you talk about Linda getting a recognition and uh, a, a special session during the SOT meeting, I would also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that our own uh, council member, Chuck May, has received the Distinguished Toxicology Scholar Award from the Society of Toxicology. So I just want to let members of council that are not aware that uh, one of our own uh, it's going to be uh, recognized with the Distinguished Toxicology Scholars Award. Great. Jose, thanks for pointing that out. And unfortunately, there were um, so many slides. That was one slide that I had a slide for, and I, I decided that I wanted to be conservative. I wanted plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, so that was one, unfortunately, I, I, I actually, you'll see it in the write-up, but uh, that's a real accomplishment. So should make con congratulations. And, I encourage all of you to be there for this uh, remarkable recognition. So thanks again for pointing that out. Thank you. Yes. And also I want to bring up a former council member. Thank you. I want to bring up a former council member, Norman Kaminsky. He also got an award. Yeah. So there are, there are many. You will read about this in the, the council book. And I, again, just apologize that I, I couldn't go through all of the recognitions. And it was... Um, it's basically last night I decided, <laughs> you know, I've got 65 slides, and I'm committed to, when I give these presentations, to have plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, it was tough. I, it was almost a coin toss to figure out which ones I included and which ones I didn't. So it, was, it wasn't for lack of interest. Sir. Mike, I'm not sure if I have a question. It's a, more of a suggestion. but. Mm -hmm. I mean, the exposome's been around, the at least the term's around for like 15 years, and the concept's mm -hmm. probably been around longer. And I'm just wondering if maybe we need some sort of integrated dissemination and engagement plan for exposomics with medical groups, other ICs, and other uh, genomicists uh, to, to start to get them aware of and perhaps interested in integrating with us. And, and maybe we need to... I guess what I'm saying is I, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. I wonder if we need a plan for dissemination. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. And in fact, I was, I was actually quite surprised when I raised my hand and said, well, what about the exposome? And I actually got a number of emails from people across the NIH, and it's like, whoa, that sounds actually really interesting. What is it? So we, we have to do a better job of, of getting out there and disseminating this information. 
In fact, uh, Gwen and I have been talking more about this. And uh, so she's going to be going to this Copenhagen meeting on the ICDA, you know, bringing kind of the exposome to this group. But we thought that maybe it's a good idea to have kind of a reciprocal meeting. Why don't we get the exposome scientists together um, at the NIH and invite some of the, the genome science people to come and join us? So I think one of the things that, uh, that the Genome Project did well is really defined what is it that the, the, the Genome Project is? What is it not? What are the time frames? And can we have an estimate of how much it's going to cost? So do we want to do the same thing with the Exposome Project? You know, what is it? What is it not? And I think there's, you know, from my point of view, I'd love to get people around the table uh, talking together and saying, you know, is there a concept that we all agree on that this is what the exposome is about, and defining that, and then uh, disseminating this, this common information, and we all go out there in a concerted way and spread the word on this. So I think there are some very specific things, and hopefully the next time I'm up here at our next council meeting, I can give you an update on, on some of the things we're doing. But I'm also one, you know, develop a plan and then execute on the plan. And my sense is that uh, having you know, this, this meeting to talk about what is the exposome and how can we be interfacing with the, the genome science folks uh, just makes a lot of sense to me. So we're, we're testing this out, and, uh, and Gwen will have a great opportunity to kind of bring back some intelligence uh, for the environmental health sciences community. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Other comments? How am I doing on time, Pat? Sorry? I say your time is up, but go ahead and oh, okay, my keep time the conversation is up. going if you need to. So let's see. The trap door is not opening yet, but uh, we'll see. If I disappear in a second, that means I'm running over. Other comments? Any, uh, actually, one last, anyone, last pressing comment that anyone would like to make? Anyone on the phone uh, other than Chick May? Comments? Well, I'll tell you what, then let me wind up so we can stay relatively on time. So thanks again for this opportunity to to be in front of all of you today, and thanks all of you for your service. Um, I know how much time this takes out of your day, and this is critically important for us at the Institute. Still not, there we go, thank you. Um, before we introduce our next speaker, I just kind of want to give an introduction for the, sort of the rest of the day. As Rick mentioned in, in his report just now, and as um, I emailed council members earlier about, and if you've looked at your agenda, even glancing at it, um, you'll see that we're going to be devoting this, as, this afternoon's agenda to data science. Um, we're going to have two presentations, one from Charles Schmidt here in a minute, and then another by, uh, from Lyric Jordanson after lunch. Um, after that, I will give a brief presentation on some of DERT's uh, activities and a couple of presentations after that from other DERT staff, and then uh, concept clearance um, after that. But um, we've left an hour at the end of the day for hopefully a robust discussion about the future of uh, data science in the extramural uh, community. Um, the overall goal of the afternoon is to get your ideas from all the different perspectives of the research you do on how we should um, move our data science efforts forward. I'll ask you to keep this in mind as you're listening and um, bring them to the discussion at the end of the day. Logistically, I've, we've left a little time at the end of each presentation, but I'm going to ask that you, if you have questions, to limit those questions specifically to the talk and, and save your more general, um, broader questions and philosophies to the end of the day. So with that, I'd like to get started, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian Barrage, our um, director of the DNTP here at NIHS. So it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce your next speaker, who is Dr. Charles Schmidt. Charles is the, uh, the director of the Office of Data Sciences, which administratively sits within the DNTP. But like the other elements of our cyber infrastructure, um, it actually is an enterprise resource, so he doesn't just serve the uh, DNTP. Uh, Dr. Schmidt has a uh, PhD in computer science from UNC. His career spans uh, both time in industry, academia, and now within government. Uh, he joined us back in 2017, and uh, we let him incubate as a contractor for a couple of years before we were able to, to officially bring him on as a federal employee uh, just this past year and since then we've been rapidly staffing up the office of data science and 
an office of uh, data science is, as I mentioned, um, a critical part of our overall cyber infrastructure. It's also integral into uh, our meeting our expectations around the promoting translation part of our strategic plan, and in particular, the data to knowledge to action. You know, one of the things that we realize in, in DNTP in particular is, is that it's, it's pretty easy these days to generate a whole lot of data. And what we've got to do is find ways of turning that data into uh, decision enabling um, uh, actions ultimately. And so um, Charles and his group are critical to that. So I'm gonna turn this over to Charles. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by first just thanking Pat for letting me come and speak today. Um, and give you some insights into what we've been doing in data science within the, the institution. And I, I need to admit that there are a lot of people, um, not just this office, involved with data science at the institution, far too many to list. Um, but I do want to acknowledge and thank the um, current and prior leadership at NIEHS for investing in data science and giving us the opportunity to really look at how data science can impact environmental health. Um, going back to um, what Rick had pointed out, in terms of the organizational structure of data science at NIEHS, we have kind of two offices, two groups that have to think about data science on a very regular basis, the, the Office of Data Science as well as a data science working group, and you'll hear from, from um, members of that group, um, I think, throughout the day. In addition, those two groups are supported by our cyber infrastructure um, capabilities, the Office of Environmental Science Cyber Infrastructure, which Rich mentioned, kind of oversees IT and informatics. The Office of Scientific Computing, which houses our high performance computing and scientific computing. The Office of Communications and Public Liaison, which um, holds our web component, um, as well as the Office of Information Technology, which is our traditional enterprise IT and program management office, which is supporting the the um, operations of all these groups together. Um, so across these groups, um, we are really looking at supporting both IT, informatics, and data science, ranging from the, the topic of governance down to the infrastructure, tools, cloud strategy, training, um, so across the board. But I should also mention that um, data science within the institution is also more of an ecosystem. It's much more like you might see statistics. It's broadly spread around. Um, there are cores and PIs that are, are doing data science, that are using data-driven approaches, as well as different offices that um, are fairly committed to advancing their own capabilities in data science, and that are also supporting other groups and in, in giving aid and in, in kind of raising the bar for data science at NIEHS. Um, we have not one, but actually three strategic plans um, that relate to data science. Um, at the bottom, the Office of Data Science, when I first joined in IEHS as a contractor, we put together a strategic plan um, for the office, really looking at where we were going to focus activities. Um, fairly recently, with David Fargo coming in as the director of the um, cyber infrastructure, we've put together a more comprehensive IT and informatics strategic plan, um, which data knowledge management sits within so that we can look broadly at the perspective of where we're putting resources across that entire landscape. Um, at the same time, the NIH has produced their data science strategy, um, which is now being in part directed by the Office of Data Science Strategy. And despite the fact that we have three kind of plans here, they, they all fairly well align. They all focus on cyber infrastructure to support data collection and analysis. They focus on methods, on communities, on workforce development. Um, we have a little bit um, higher um, probably presence for data governance in, in the Office of Data Science. But I think um, the fact that they align, but not completely, I think gives us an opportunity, really. Because if you look at what NIH is doing at the Office of Data Science Strategy and across some of the larger ICs, they have a large focus on the, the data ecosystems and data cyber infrastructure. Um, which is a costly thing to, to start building up. How do we share and, and put cyber infrastructures up that allow people to sign on with a single ID and to search for data um, and find it and provision it in the cloud? And th these are fairly expensive and complex tasks, and, and a number of ICs are working together 
And, and we contribute in part to that, at looking how, at how to do that. But I think NIEHS can also benefit from that work from the other ICs, but at the same time, use that opportunity to focus on what I think are probably more challenges for um, the environmental health community, in particular data integration. I'm going to come back to that topic because I, it, to me it's a very important one um, for the kinds of data that, that this community generates. You can also look at NIEHS intramural, the, the intramural research program and the national toxicology program as a microcosm of the broader community. We have to deal with data collection, of diversity of data, curating it, managing, giving it out to different kinds of customers, um, security, we have to deal with workforce development, with building cyber infrastructures to support this, with actually applying data analytics, um, looking at places where we think there are new methods that need to be developed. I'll come back to that, as well as surveying the landscape and looking at what new methods are looking promising and what we can bring into day-to-day -day use within the institution. So I was also asked if I could provide a working definition of data science which I'm kind of happy to do because I, I have a strong opinion on this. To me, um, I use a working definition that's really a combination of the disciplines needed to advance data and knowledge-driven discovery and decision support. And so I, I took that working definition and I laid out, to me, what are the various skills and expertise that are needed to support data-driven science um, at an institutional level based upon my work here and, and prior work I've done in industry and academics. And if you look around this circle, what I've kind of laid out is on the far left we have software development. As you go clockwise, you have computing system, dead ops, databases, so really the engineering part of, of the cyber infrastructure. And then as you go around the, the top from one o'clock down to four o'clock, um, you get really the, the data processing management curation pieces of, of wrangling with data, doing basic reporting and analysis and business intelligence. And then at the bottom you get down to the application through statistics, machine learning, and AI. Um, a couple of ones that I'll point out, data engineering up at the top right, to me that's really the, the use of more advanced data um, technologies and methods. So you might think NoSQL databases, if you're familiar with those, or graph databases, or systems like Hadoop and Sparkle, um, which traditionally aren't um, things that software engineers are necessarily taught um, when they're dealing with kind of traditional data. The other one I'll point out is semantic engineering over on the far right. I use that term broadly to mean any, any work being done around metadata, common data elements, terminologies, and ontologies. Um, and then probably the most important part of this entire thing is down at the bottom right around four or five o'clock domain translators. And these are really the people that can work with the rest of those um, sets of skills and people to apply those into the domains that, that they're interested in. Um, I filled it out from what would be an engineering perspective, and I did this because I thought it was interesting to look at the different ways that people think about data science. Um, having come from industry, industry has often a very engineering-focused perspective on data science. They build tools and try to sell tools that let you capture data, manipulate data, and make it available, irregardless of kind of what you're trying to do with that data. Um, and so that's one kind of broad perspective on data science that, that um, tends to be dominated in the industry side. There's also the kind of traditional analytical perspective, which is the, the AI, AI machine learning statistics domain translation. Um, the only thing I'll say here is that if, if you feel that statistics equals data science, it really isn't, um, and it really needs to be thought about broadly because it's, it's a cross-disciplinary field. Um, then on the, the, the far right, I put the perspective from the kinds of skills you need to support data curation and data management. And this is an area that NIH is actually fairly focused on right now as we think about making data fair and open and shareable. Because um, I thought it would be very interesting, I, I put down our own office, the Office of Data Science, and where we've staffed up. So we actually, when we created the office, looked around at the capabilities within NIEHS as well as, as well as where NIH wanted to go with this concept of fair and open data. And so we've hired around that. So the institution itself is actually fairly strong in biostatistics, epidemiology, 
um, and, and statistics generally. So we didn't hire in that area. We, we hired where the institution was more weak, which was software development, dev apps, using um, complex um, data systems and databases, as well as in, in the data curation side. <clears throat> and as you can see, that, you know, that gives us fairly broad coverage across the data science space, um, but not everything is covered. <clears throat> and that gets to the first set of challenges. If, if you look broadly at the institution and our own office and what kinds of skills you need to support data-driven science, <clears throat> you can look at it from the, the perspective of staffing. And, and if you notice, there's a lot of different skill sets on that radar plot that I mentioned. For us, semantic engineers are really, really difficult to find. Um, it's honestly a seller's market and people can demand things of us that I normally wouldn't um, possibly allow for other types of hires. Domain translators, this is always a perennial problem. And it's been brought up before, I think, last year's workshop on, on training. Um, AI expertise, we have, at least I have in our group, focused away from hiring AI expertise because it's very subfield specific, meaning if I hire an NLP person, that person may not be useful for doing image processing. So we instead look at partnerships and, and collaborations to bring in that capabilities. Data engineering is actually an interesting one. It, it's one that's close to my heart, but um, it's the one that's probably the hardest to apply within NIEHS because we as an institution aren't used to using those kinds of technologies and they don't always necessarily apply um, within the life science concept. So that's, that's one of, uh, I believe, we will increasingly mature into doing more in that, that spectrum. Um, we also, of course, face the, the challenge of competing with industry. The skill sets here are ones that are broadly applicable. And so we, we compete with industry, which is a real hiring challenge within the federal government. Um, the other thing that you should notice from that that radar plot is because there are a lot of different skill sets and a lot of different backgrounds being brought together to enable data-driven science, it means that team science is especially important. Um, but finding a common language between those types of people and, and having them be able to talk to each other and be productive is, is especially challenging. Um, I, interestingly, I have one of our, our staff scientists say yesterday that it's been really fun to work with programmers and, and data scientists because it was a new world for her. Um, it's been kind of the same way from my perspective, um, learning a, a whole lot about things I never knew about. Um, but that also brings up the, the challenge of training because not only do we have to train for developing specific expertise or train for projects, but we have to look at training broadly to kind of raise the floor and get everyone to a common level um, of being able to engage effectively and understand what a data engineer might, might how they might view the world and, and a data engineer has to understand how a biologist might view the world and why biologists don't, don't annotate and take capture metadata and everything that they do. Um, the other problem this brings up is that the, the data science field itself is moving really rapidly right now. And so being able to identify and determine the fitness of different approaches and to bring them into day-to-day -day use is, is a real challenge and it impacts, again, training and upskilling people. <clears throat> so let me get to FAIR because this is really you know, a central component of our strategy of NIEHS and NIH. Um, and I, I hope everyone is familiar with this concept of FAIR. It's, it's really how do we make research data open and shareable. Um, specifically findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We've, um, for a while now, been adding on to that calling it FAIR Plus to add on the moniker of computable, meaning it, it's great if data is FAIR and put somewhere on an FTP site, but that doesn't really help me um, write programs that can go against that data. It doesn't help me automate things, and it doesn't help me deal with data at scale. So really, how do we get the bar a little bit higher to making data very readily computable by those teams of, of data scientists. Another one that I've recently been um, wanting to add is this concept of socialized, which I'm, I'm just really beginning to, to appreciate, which is how do we build communities around the data? Um, people that understand the data, that can advise on the data, that can share tips and techniques. Um, I had a 
kind of an interesting experience recently on a project where we're looking at building predictive models where we start with the survey data and we start by picking up the phone and calling people, which you know, for computer scientists, you're not using Google, you're using old technology. Um, but really, how do you build those, that socialization um, so that we can do this at, at scale and more efficiently? And then the last one is, is mineable, um, which is a kind of a, a topic that's getting a lot more attention. But when we collect and generate data, how do we do it in a way that makes it more amenable to, to building predictive models? Um, and if you haven't collected data to make it mineable, it's actually challenging. Um, and it forces people to do things that they don't want to do. And so that's actually a, a tough one, but it's one that I think um, broadly people would agree is, is one that we want to spend effort on. <clears throat> we, we have within NIHS, as we're thinking about implementing our strategic plans, taking this moniker affair and actually looking at, well, for each data set that we have, that we make available, where does it fit on the spectrum affair and where do we want to get it to? So um, these are just some of the data sets that, that we have. And I've kind of changed the dimensions from FAIR to ones that are more operational. So is our data described? Does it have column names? Does it, does it have a data dictionary? So pretty low bar, but a bar that's workable in many cases. Going all the way over to, to socialize, which is not something that, that is easy to do with data within the federal government. Um, but we're, we're looking at filling that in and, and getting data to move along that pathway. And this brings up really one of the biggest challenges I have um, is how far do you go with FAIR? Um, if you look at that, that chart of FAIR Plus, going up that chart increases the community utility of that data, but it also increases the cost of doing this and sustaining that data. Um, and so we have a kind of traditional cost versus common good trade-off going on. And I think this is particularly challenging in the, in the environmental health sciences because of the diversity of the data and because a lot of the data isn't large-scale data where, you know, the investment and cost has a clear um, common good trade-off, but where you have lots of smaller or medium-sized data where the costs start aggregating um, and the common good trade-off is not as obvious. So for me, this is a particularly challenging one, um, and I would suspect as we generate more and more data and, and look at where we invest in making it available, being able to understand where we try to get data is, is an important thing to, to work out as a community. Um, this is kind of an illustration of this in my mind. Uh, we have been doing work with University of North Carolina under the NCATS Data Translator Program, which is a program looking at how do you take all the data that's out there and make it computable and let people query it and let um, people build AI systems that can reason across this data. Um, in this particular project, um, UNC, um, primarily and with some advising from us, has taken CMAC models, which are estimated air pollution models from EPA, which are put out on their website as files with very large documentation um, that basically makes it not approachable for anyone that doesn't have a degree in um, environmental health and GIS systems. But putting that into data systems, um, putting APIs on top of it where you can just say, I have a, a patient that lives at this location and they were in the emergency room last week, can you give me the air exposure um, estimates for that, for that location? And UNC has actually done this, um, integrating it with a similar clinical API so that they can ask these kinds of questions, getting back aggregate data without having to go through an IRB or governance process because there's a governance that oversees the whole thing. So you can start asking questions of the data um, much more quickly and in integrating um, elements that you might want to in integrate. And this again goes back to that question of, okay, they've gone pretty far with this. It's a fairly far along the, the fair plus spectrum. Um, how do we sustain this and, and where do we invest in these kinds of things? We have that same conversation going on around um, ToxNet, which is resources that the National Library of Medicine has been hosting for years. Um, the Library of Medicine is consolidating some of their operations, and so they are moving some of ToxNet resources, including data and educational resources, into kind of their, their main line offerings, so PubMed, PubChem, the MCI bookshelf. And they're looking at either retiring or archiving or completely getting rid of a 
a few of these, and these are all ongoing conversations that we're also having um, with NLM. In particular, we have downloaded the carcinogenic potency database and just found out that EPA is currently doing the same thing, so we might not have to do that in the future. Um, but we're also going to fund this year the continuation of the consumer products information database because that, that system was at risk of losing the expertise and, and the people that were actually building this. And so if we lost that expertise, it would not be capable of bringing that back. So that's one where we are making an investment, but we're also looking at some of these others um, and trying to make that, that common good versus cost judgment. Um, and so that brings up kind of, to me, one of the most important slides in this deck. These kinds of decisions are being made in the kind of traditional NIH way through RFIs, through working groups, through uh, meetings to discuss these things, and, and ultimately through the grants that people put forward and, and get funded. Um, and so getting community input into these processes is really important um, to understand where we make these trade-offs. In particular, um, NIH has recently put out their draft policy for data sharing, which will mandate um, data management plans, and by default, the, the idea that data should be shared openly. Um, and they have just put out a RFI for um, desirable characteristics of repositories to get input on what people think a repository should provide. We, we think these are important enough that we have brought together internally um, our different divisions and put together unified responses. Um, so we we've, we've pulled everyone's thoughts together, put them together, and submitted them as a single institutional response to try to hopefully bolster the message and, and the impact of our opinions in this area. But I would definitely encourage people to, to keep an ear out for these kinds of, of opportunities to engage in IH along these lines. All right, so I'm going to transition to a different part of the talk. Um, so into more of some of the specific kinds of data science activities we're doing where I see some of the challenges and opportunities. And this goes back to, to um, within DNTP, we have this concept that's um, being fleshed out of a translational toxicology pipeline that starts with that green bubble over to the left where you're looking at existing knowledge and mining that, and then moving gradually from in silico to in vivo to in vitro approaches, um, trying to, to get deeper and deeper into mechanisms. And the really nice thing about that approach is, as a data scientist, I can look at that and say, okay, what are the data flows? What are the tools? What are the technologies? What do we need to do to help enable that and to do it better? And so we are in the process of trying to do that. We've sat down and start cataloging all the tools that we're building and developing all the databases and trying to strategically figure out where we want to best put resources. And so um, you can look at this as a, a great, um, way to look at how do we capture all the characterizations, how do we use those to inform the pipeline in the future through specific tools. And I'm going to go into two of these in particular, systematic review characterization and the, the data integration um, component. But you know, really, you could go into any of these and, and give a, a nice, enjoyable talk on, in data science. Um, in systematic review, this is a formalized process that NTP uses um, when they're looking at um, gathering evidence um, that's already been published, of going through evidence, really having humans read journal articles and pull out information that we want to capture, that we want to aggregate and develop reports on. Um, and so this is expensive, is ultimately rate limiting um, based upon the time it takes humans to do this kind of work. But it's also at a critical juncture point in the scientific process because the point at which someone takes data and writes a paper is the point at which they change it from data to knowledge. And it's really the knowledge that we want to get out. And so even though I've been talking about FAIR and how important that is, if you give me a thousand data sets, I'm kind of stuck because it would take as long to reanalyze that thousand data sets um, as it would to read those papers and pull out the knowledge that was generated in the first place. So this is kind of a critical juncture point to be able to, to do better in data science. And I should note, you know, there are groups doing this, but they don't tend to do it at the level of um, capturing details or capturing the quality of the papers that NTP is really looking for in their work. 
So what we did a couple of years ago is so we start building training and test data sets to build um, natural language processing slash AI models to try to see if we can, we can um, make progress in this area. So we went through and we annotated with the kinds of information that we want to pull out, so sex, species, dose, route of administration, endpoints, um, built up 200 um, test articles and put those out to the community at a NIST Text Analytics Conference Challenge and asked people to build models that could try to approach what human be, um, performance is. And up at the right you see the, the results, the, um, well that color didn't show up very well. The, um, the tan light colored is the performance of the best models and the green is the comparison inter-rater um, agreement between a senior curator and a senior um, QA person. So that's kind of the best that we, we see the humans getting to. And you can see in a couple of places like sex and species, these are, these are pretty easy to pull out. All right, um, the human, the models do pretty good. In a few places, they do really poorly. Um, and then in some, they actually look promising, not quite at human level, but actually getting within striking distance. Um, and the other thing I, I note about this is that um, despite the fact that we only had a couple hundred articles and training deep neural models in this space means training millions of parameters, these models did by far better than any other models. And main reason, well, one of the main reasons they did better was that the people using them relied heavily on transfer learning. So that's basically training a model on other data and bringing that information to bear on your problem. In this case, they, they ran a, um, what's known as an embedding algorithm across all of PubMed to get out the statistics and the correlational structure of how scientists talk about um, information. And that correlational structure, having that embedded in models, helped the, the models do well on this specific task. So we're now at the point of, okay, we've, we've built models, they look promising, let's put them into action. So we're taking those models, we're putting them into a tool that human curators can use to, instead of going in and finding the, the elements they want to extract, the models are suggesting what to extract. So the humans can go in and say, I think that's right, I think that's wrong, I think that's wrong, I'm gonna change it. Um, and we're looking at, does that help improve accuracy and speed. And if it does, then we, we are in a situation where we have a positive feedback loop of humans using the tools, generating better data that we can improve the models upon, and, and we can really start doing more and more in this area. So um, we're currently in that process, and, and hopefully in the next six months we'll have um, results saying whether or not this actually does work. I, I will say one thing that's been fairly clear is that because the, the models can go through an entire document, the models can pull out every endpoint that someone mentions, whereas a human being typically when they go through this kind of document, they're pulling out the endpoints related to the study purpose that they're doing it for. And, and that enables actually us to start looking at, well, how will we mine this information and use it um, beyond just the, the purposes of that project. So I think this starts opening up a lot of possibilities. Um, then I want to get into the topic of data integration. This is, to me, probably the, the most important topic here. Um, it's one that I see probably the biggest challenges in the environmental health um, space as I've, I've come into this space. And it really resolves down to the diversity of, of environmental health data, the kinds of data, the scale of data, the domains of data make it really hard to look at how do you integrate that data and, and actually find things from it. And, and I think probably people are aware of a lot of the challenges we're bridging between different model systems, model animals, as well as in vitro. The, the data is actually really sparse. We can only measure so much. And so you get matrices that are mostly empty. You're integrating across measurement platforms and, and different systems and the space of, of things that you're trying to measure isn't constant, it's evolving. Um, but traditionally, when you look at data integration, there's a, there's a few ways that you approach it. You can integrate it syntactically, which is, I'm just, I have two data sets and they, they link on some kind of term and I'm going to stick them together. And that's what traditionally people do because it's fast and, and gets you to where you're going. 
you can integrate at the semantic level, which is at the concept. So is this data measuring a similar concept as that data, which means that you have to translate between things at the concept level, which can be challenging. Or you can integrate at the model and theory level. Um, I've not seen a whole lot of integration in this community at the model or theory level. Well, one, theories don't, are, you know, they're not a lot of theories um, like you might find in physics or astronomy. Um, and I think the model level is something that we really need to think about more how to integrate data science with computational modeling um, and how to couple those two fields because we should be better able to use models to look at how we integrate and represent knowledge. Um, and this kind of comes down to me to one of the biggest challenges I see is we don't have kind of analytical frameworks that guide data science and particular data integration. Um, I'll go back to kind of prior experiences I have. I, I used to work some time in the computer vision field, and there we have a very clear analytical framework for how you integrate data is 4D space and time. All right, if I take a LIDAR measurement of a car moving, I can point that to a space point in space and time and integrate that with, say, infrared signal. We don't really have kind of that obviousness of a framework for pulling together data. Um, and if we did, it would really help empower not only our data collection and curation efforts and our sharing efforts because it can, informs you of the value of that information, but how we integrate data and represent it and ultimately how we build infrastructures that support um, dealing with this data. And I, over on the right is kind of, to me, the two traditional ways that are used. The top one is the kind of common G by E, G by P get matrices and look for correlational structures, and, and that's data integration at kind of a low-level integration. The bottom is, is integrating more at the semantic level, so can we represent pathways, can we represent diseases, can we represent um, mechanisms of actions in a large computational graph that we can then start making inferences over and aligning data to there. Um, and it's kind of interesting that these two approaches are very far apart in terms of how you do these and the, the skills and technologies um, that you use to, to do this. So we are, we are starting to look more at this question of, of what can we do to help on the data integration side because I, I do think it's important. And we're starting, um, we've started by looking at the, the semantic level of integration. Um, and the semantic level, I think, is important because it comes down to how do we describe data. And there are a lot of gaps in um, what, would, what you might call environmental ontologies and environmental health ontologies and exposure ontologies, as well as a lot of gaps in terms of linking things that we measure, so endpoints, receptors, to um, those kinds of knowledge sources. And you can think if you want AOPs or pathways or disease ontologies or gene ontology. So there's a lot of work to be done here, and NIH, NIHS has over the years put efforts into advancing this area. We've had workshops, we, we're currently building ontologies for zebrafish, um, we have recently started a community of practice with EPA, and our um, Superfund team has started putting together workshops and, and talking about how to use ontologies. Um, but I think for looking at the field, what we really need is a sustained effort so that people know every year we're gonna be talking about this. We're gonna be saying, what are the gaps? Um, what are the opportunities? How do we move together as a community in terms of filling those gaps and, and really learning how to um, advance our semantics and our ability to semantically integrate and compute across data. Um, so we, we are starting to look at how can we do this. Um, we do plan, a, we are trying to plan a 2020 workshop, probably late in the year. Um, and hoping to be able to, to sustain that. Um, and this goes back to one of the reasons we're hiring semantic engineers, both to help us internally, but to help guide um, this community building process. So if, if you know good semantic engineers, please let me know. Um, but I think in addition to that, we, we really need to stimulate new methods in data integration. Um, and, and this one slide, I think, really captures to me the, the fundamental problem. And this is going back to semantics again. What is the most useful definition of a cat? Well, for humans, it's a dictionary definition that we can read and understand. Um, in the ontology space, it's really a knowledge graph. 
representing the cat in the context of other kinds of things. But what's really has um, made rapid advancements in the last five years or so in the data science and um, AI community is recoding knowledge as mathematical vectors and matrices. And that's what that bottom line represents. It's the, the vector representation of a cat. And we've seen that in that NIST challenge that moving over to a vectorized representations of concepts actually makes models perform a lot better. And this has been shown in a variety of studies where taking kind of traditional statistical approaches and then bringing in um, vectorized representations of objects can actually boost the performance across the board of, of multiple kinds of different statistical analysis approaches. So the other thing you can think about there is that, well, then you get kind of a natural bridge between that G by E, G by P representation, which is highly matrix and correlationally driven, and the knowledge world, which up to now has been very focused on strings, essentially CAT, C-A-T, as a way of representing that knowledge. Um, but when you move over to a vectorized um, approach, you now get the ability to start applying a lot of that mathematics that exists to representations of knowledge. So I think this is one of those areas that, at least to me, I, I think this um, would benefit from a lot of focus and moving forward these, these kinds of approaches. And I think it's particularly important in the environmental health com um, community because we do have such a diversity of data. Um, I will point out that if, if this is successful, um, wearing my manager director hat, it's gonna be a pain because I don't know many database people that know how to work with matrices and vectors and a lot of software engineers, you'd be surprised, don't know how to work with matrices and vectors. So it'd be really kind of changing how we, we do a lot of things in, in the data sciences, especially on the data engineering and, and database side. Um, but we are um, trying to make progress on that side. We, we haven't really started doing much there. Um, I'd love to do more. But interestingly, the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy just put out a call for data scholars. Um, and this is a program where they're really seeking experienced data and um, computational engineers um, with kind of a focus on bringing people from external fields and industry into NIH to tackle and work with people on complex biomedical challenges. And hopefully there's a transfer of expertise between those other domains and, and NIH that goes both ways. Um, so we were um, very intrigued with this and we put forward a use case to NIH and fortunately they accepted our use cases as, as one of the use cases that potential data scholars can apply in. And we put forward the use cases of advancing interoperability for environmental health um, with use cases in toxicology and environmental epidemiology. So we're, we're really hoping that we might be successful in bringing in um, new talent to look at this these challenges and, and put forward new methods that we might be able to build upon. Um, but of course, I, I don't think one person's enough, nearly enough. And so it could be how, how do we get more emphasis and more people thinking about these problems and trying to understand how to bring these together. Um, we are also at the same time trying to build up our workforce internally. Um, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but our goal really is getting to a point where our life science staff Postdocs, research fellows can all publish their own scientific tools, meaning they can write a tool, they can query a database, they can create a visualization. And so we, we are bringing in staffing to support that. We're offering training specialized in, in general to get there. We're engaging in, in different seminars to try to point these things out. And we're also bringing in tools to make it easier for, for scientists to be able to do this without having to learn that entire spectrum of data science expertise and skill sets. And on the right, I'll just point out, is one of our first successes kind of in that space. We have a toxicologist who's recently came over to NTP, had a self-interest in computer science, but has trained up on, on writing our shiny applications. We gave him a little bit of help in terms of how do you query a large database, and now we have an up and running tool that, that we can start using. So we're really trying to foster that um, ecosystem development. Um, and then I'm gonna end with this slide, which is, um, I think, you know, data science is fairly new in the world. 
Um, and in life sciences, and having offices is fairly new. There's not guidebooks to how you do this. Um, and so I, I often um, find myself thinking about what's it going to look like in three or five or ten years. So what would what would a future state of data science within life sciences look like? And I think if you go back to that breadth of skill sets we have to bring together, it raises some challenges as to you know across the spectrum, how are we going to do this? Is, is every single lab or core going to create their own data science team? Uh, I'll point out that one of our local universities is um, now offering data science kinds of services, and they have some 20 staff appropriate to this, and that doesn't seem scalable. So are we going to see a, a changing of how data science is supported that maybe models what happened in the supercomputing world, where we got um, large centers and then spokes and hub model? Or are we going to see other kinds of approaches to really support data science? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to end with um, three comics. So based upon your perspective of data science, you can pick a comic. <laughs> um, and thank you very much. Um, we'll probably have time for one question here. Remember, we'll be getting back together for discussion later. If you had a specific question for Charles, um, we can entertain that right now. Okay, if not, like I say, Charles will be back. He'll be as part of our panel for our discussion later. Um, in order to make our um, agenda to work today, we started lunch a little bit early. So um, we have 90 minutes. We need to start back up here at 12.45 with Dr. Lyric Jorgensen. She'll be by WebEx, so we need to start on time. So enjoy lunch, and we'll see you after a while. <laughs>